Tonight and every night for the rest of your life, I want you to take the last five minutes before you go off to sleep and realize that you are about to program your subconscious mind. All right? Your subconscious mind is most at home when you are unconscious, when you are asleep. If you spend the last five minutes of your day, which so many people do, reviewing all of the things that you don't like and all the things that didn't work out and how terrible you feel and who abused you and who was mean to you and who said this and they did this and you're constantly doing this kind of thing with your mind, then you are programming your subconscious mind that when you awaken, because you're now about to marinate for the next eight hours in your subconscious mind. And then when you awaken, you will rejoin the universal sub subconscious mind, the mind of God, from which we all originate. We're all just individualized personal expressions of that one thing that we call the Tao, or God, or divine mind, or soul, or spirit. But the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. So you want to be real careful about how you program your subconscious mind. This is from the book of Job. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Job 33, 15 and 16. When you are slumbering on your bed, he opens your ears and seals your instruction. What you place into your subconscious mind as you are about to go into this deep slumber is all dependent upon what you do the last three or four or five minutes before you go off to sleep. You want to place into your imagination whatever you have placed into the I am that that I spoke about earlier. I am well. I am content. I am peaceful. I am happy. I am prosperous. I am abundant. I am God. I am God. I am God. Because at the basic core, each and every one of us are just that. So it's like if you just close your eyes and just listen to this meditation. <clears throat> It's from the book, Three Magic Words. Here's what I'd like you to say to yourself at night. I know that I am pure spirit, that I always have been, and that I always will be. There is inside me a place of confidence and quietness and security where all things are known and understood. This is the universal mind, God, of which I am a part and which responds to me as I ask of it. This universal mind knows the answer to all of my problems. And even now, the answers are speeding their way to me. I needn't struggle for them. I needn't worry or strive for them. When the time comes, the answers will be there. I give my problems to the great mind of God. I let go of them, confident that the correct answers will return to me when they are needed. Through the great law of attraction, everything in life that I need for my work and fulfillment will come to me. It is not necessary that I strain about this. Only believe, for in the strength of my belief, my faith will make it so. I see the hand of divine intelligence all about me, in the flower, the tree, the brook, the meadow. I know that the intelligence that created all these things is in me and around me, and that I can call upon it for my slightest need. I know that my body is a manifestation of pure spirit, and that spirit is perfect. Therefore, my body is perfect also. I enjoy life, for each day brings a constant demonstration of the power and wonder of the universe and myself. I am confident. I am serene. I am sure. No matter what obstacle or undesirable circumstance crosses my path, I refuse to accept it, for it is nothing but illusion. There can be no obstacle or undesirable circumstance to the mind of God, which is in me, 
around me and serves me now. This is the great lesson. Know this within you. When Herman Melville was writing Moby Dick, he wasn't writing about a man looking for a whale. He was writing about a, a man trying to find his higher self. He said these words, for as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. In every moment of your life as you leave here today, you have this choice. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. Thank you. God bless you. Namaste. Thank you. In order to cultivate your witness, you need to learn to observe your reactions in order to go beyond them. It is the going beyond that is the crux of the sacred quest. There are many ways that you can use the observation process. Here are a couple of them that are very important. The first is observing your body. This is one of the areas of being the witness that most of us have practiced somewhat. In general, we allow our body to function without interference. We are aware that there is the body and that there is a ghost in the machine, if you will. For as long as you can remember, you have been observing this phenomenon of a body. It is also true that you know that the entity that is doing the observing is removed in some dramatic way from that which it is witnessing. As you are listening to these words, you are allowing your body to act out its destiny without your meddling. You are not busy beating your heart or filling your lungs or oxygenating your blood supply or circulating your vital fluids. You allow your body to operate itself and you allow another part of you to know the way of being the divine, quiet, non-interfering observer. This way has served you well. By just observing your body and detaching yourself from its functioning, it works as perfectly as it was ordained to. If you were constantly monitoring and attempting to control your bodily functions, you would be unduly attached to its outcome and you would inhibit its natural functions. The times in your life when you worry or interfere with the natural functions of your body are the times when you find it breaking down. Feed your body the wrong foods and it will respond with lethargy and disease. Fail to exercise it and it will become overweight and groggy. Ignore its needs for fresh air and healthy environment and it will fall into disrepair. Feed it narcotic substances or artificial drugs and it will react with violent symptoms. When your body is in any state of disrepair from being overweight to having back pains or nervousness or influenza or cancer or anything that is not the way of perfect health that your body knows at the cellular and genetic levels, then you are being called back to the position of loving witness. The second way of observing is called observing your mind. Your mind is filled with thousands of thoughts every day. They come and they go like trains in a terminal. One enters, another takes its place, one exits and along comes another. First you want to watch your thoughts, then you want to watch yourself watching your thoughts. Here is the door to the inner space where, free from all thoughts, you experience the bliss and the freedom that transport you directly to your higher self. The simple exercise of watching your mind manufacturing its thoughts will eventually cause unwanted, unnecessary, erroneous thoughts to dissolve. In the process of cultivating the witness, you learn to quiet your mind, to take inventory, and dispose of or reassign thoughts that generate self-defeating or ego-centered responses. In this simple process, you also come to know your spiritual self. Ego-generated thoughts play a huge role in creating the world that the ego wishes to create. Each of my thoughts seem to demand it be considered the most important. Troubles begin with a thought that you put into your mind and allow to fester to the point of anxiety. The anxiety begins to manifest in your life in physically destructive ways, which we call things like arthritis, high blood pressure, and career cardiacs. The loving, non-judgmental energy received from the observer or the witness will allow these thoughts to flow in and out as naturally as the ocean tides. Tides in, tides out. Thoughts in, thoughts out. You will learn to be a witness to your thoughts in the same way that you observe the tide. 
and the process will cleanse and redistribute and remove thoughts in much the same way as the driftwood on the beach. What remains is generally quite pleasing. Witnessing your thoughts will take some practice. With proficiency comes wonder and delight. Trauma is dissolved in the thinking stage and prevented from manifesting into your everyday world. Begin to notice the noticer. As you take note of your worlds, both inner and outer, begin to familiarize yourself with the noticer who is behind that which is being noticed. If you do this several times each day, you will begin to see that you are much more than just a body and mind going through the program motions of your life. Your realization of your true self as the witness behind that which is being witnessed will bring you a new dimension of creativity and bliss. Try on this exercise. Think of something that has been bothering you for a long period of time. Now go to a quiet place and close your eyes. Just see the problem surfacing on the blank screen in your consciousness. Notice all aspects of the problem, what it looks like, when it shows up, what you feel when it is on your mind, the pain and the fear that you have when it is present, how you have dealt with it unsuccessfully in the past. Think of everything that you can which is related to the problem. Then, detach yourself in your mind from the problem. Just allow it to sit there on the screen of your mind. Look at it from the viewpoint of the compassionate witness who just non-judgmentally notices the screen. Watch it like a movie, allowing it to change in whatever way it does. Just observe it with loving permission for it to do whatever it wants to do. You will see it change and fade in and out of awareness. With each change or movement on the screen, remain in the caring witness mode of knowing the energy will do what it will and will also be accompanied by the loving energy from the witness. Often, just this act of observation will result in a feeling of the problem having dissipated. If that happens, observe that also from the position of caring observer. I once practiced this act of observation when I was injured and unable to play tennis. I reacted at first to the pain in my foot with statements like, this injury is keeping me from doing what I want to do and I'm really upset about it. I found that no matter what I tried, the pain persisted and I was unable to pivot and consequently had to discontinue an activity that I loved. I then took the witness stance. I no longer saw myself as having an injury. I attributed the pain only to my body and not to me. I witnessed the entire thing and merely watched it. I lovingly witnessed the pain, the way it showed up, my feelings of frustration about it, the color of the swelling, everything. But I refused to think of it as mine. It was only my body's problem. The very same day that I did this, the entire discomfort disappeared. I mean, it was gone from my body. I had put my attention on what was occurring and detached myself from it. And in what seemed like a few hours, I no longer had the pain and I was playing tennis as if I had never experienced any injury at all. In order to know the benefit of witnessing, you will have to banish the doubt about this as something that will work for you. Remember, you have been conditioned to believe that your body is the essence of your humanity. You've been taught to tackle problems with your physical and intellectual apparatus, not your higher self. Practice new self-talk sentences to replace your old identification with your physical body. I am that which owns this body. I am not the body itself. I can't be reached if you come to me with hatred or anger. I cannot worry when I refuse to be the worrier and simply observe that worrier and the worries. Self-talk sentences will keep you centered on your spiritual domain. You will find that many things that you worried about or experienced in a negative fashion are slowly beginning to diminish from your life. Let's go for a moment to our dream. And just assume that we're going to have a dream. We're in bed. And let me ask you this question. This is a question I like to ask for you to just contemplate, one of those sort of cones. When you go to sleep at night and enter your dream state, what happens to the bed? Just think about that. What happens to the bed? Now you're in your dream, okay? So just propel yourself into a dream state. And in your dream, you notice, oh, let's say you're over here and you're in a room. And in this room, you look across the room and you notice that there's a podium in the room and it has some objects on it. Now you're in your dream. So in the state of dream consciousness, you say to yourself, I would like to examine that podium more closely. How do you do it in your dream? How do you examine it more closely in your dream state? 
Do you get out of bed? Is there a bed? Now, we're talking about one-third of your life here, folks, okay? One-third of your life. As Lao Tzu said, I went to sleep and dreamt that I was a butterfly. Then I woke up, and now I don't know. Am I a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, or am I a butterfly who's dreaming that he's a man? <laughs> so in your dream state, do you get up out of bed, keep it right over there, say, excuse me, honey, uh, wait, uh, get up. And walk over and say, oh, here, oh, there's a galley of a new book, and there's a pen here, and there's a glass of water. I think I'll have a drink of that. There's a microphone stand. There's things. Do you do that? No, you don't do that. Because you enter your dream without any doubt. So what you do in your dream state is, are you ready? Shoo! Stay alert. <laughs> and you bring it to you don't you? In your dream state. Why? Because you have the power of your intention, can have an idea, and whatever you need for the fulfillment of your dream, you bring to you. Here it is. Here it is. Whatever you need. So you're 20 years old in your dream, and you need a jerk to be married to for the next 20 years. There he is. Isn't that great? You need a Maserati? There it is. Whatever you need for the dream, you bring to it. Then you leave the dream and you come into waking consciousness. And now you look back on the dream and you now have a whole new set of things that you've introduced. And that set of things is called doubt. And the second key to higher awareness, which I'll get to shortly, is called banishing the doubt. But it's, it's connected here. As you enter your dream state, you enter without any doubt about your capacity to do anything. So you can fly, you can jump over trees, you can be young again, you can uh, transcend death, you can stay underwater, you can, do, you can uh, communicate telepathically with anyone that you want to, right? You have all of these incredible powers. And if someone has died and you want them back, shoop, you bring them back. If you need to be 12 again, shoop. and then you come into this state, and you say, I can't do any of those things because you're stuck in paradigms. And the paradigm says, you cannot change your shape. You can't shape shift. If you're a certain age, you're a certain age. You can't move yourself into, you can't be in more than one place at the same time, which you can do in your dream easily. You can't do those things. And one of the things I talk about in your sacred self is like learning to become a waking dreamer, to understand that you don't have to go to sleep in order to dream. So now you wake up, and what I'm suggesting to you is that this is also a dream, only it's a hundred-year dream. And in this hundred-year dream, everything that you can do in your eight-hour dream, you can do in this hundred-year dream. Everything. If you know better than to doubt it. And if you get rid of the paradigms that muck up your life. You have the capacity. But the minute that you introduce doubt into it, like that poem that I started out, Real Magic, which is really my effort to write about how to manifest miracles in your life, from Samuel Taylor Coldridge, he said, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there picked a strange and wonderful flower? And what if... When you awoke, you held that flower in your hand. Ah, what then? Is it possible to bring something from a dream state into a waking state? Or is that part of a paradigm? And the tiniest smidgen of doubt that enters your consciousness is what you will act upon. Seven key little words from Proverbs, as you think, so shall you be. If you think that it's not possible, what you think about is what expands. Or as Emerson said, the, at the ancestor to every action is a thought. And the minute you have a doubtful thought in your consciousness, you will act upon that and manifest the fruit of that doubt. And not be able to see it. You will not see it. If we, we, so if, if we begin to shift our, 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 our statements, the, you know, the statements, first of all, that we say to ourselves, 
And then the statements that would say, because, you know, and so what I want everybody who's listening today to do is to take a look at, you know, all of the things in your life that you don't like that aren't working the way you would like them to work, whether it's in your relationships, whether it's financial, whether it's with your health, what, whether with, with your job, with your friendships or whatever it might be. And instead of saying, uh, and, and when you ask yourself, now, how did it come to be this way? Kind of go back and, and go all the way back as far as you can go to even being a young boy or a young girl. And, and how many times have you heard or said the words that were predictive of this being showing up in your life? And then get to a place where you start to change that around. And you have a different, not only a different set of expectations, but a different way of making decrees so that you decree that things are going to work out that your prosperity is on its way, that your relationship is going to improve, that your health is uh, is something that you have control over. I'll give you an example of this, and then we'll open up to the phones. My daughter Serena is here, um, uh, who's written a book called Don't Die With Your Music Still In You. It's uh, a book that I give out on the show to people who call in. My experience growing up with spiritual uh, parents. And she has a new little baby. Uh, her baby's name is Sailor, and Sailor is uh, three months old. Now, Sailor has uh, something uh, uh, called acid reflux, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, so, so that her stomach, you know, so when, when she's nursing or when she gets her bottle or whatever it is, um, she, she starts throwing up a lot. Now, uh, my daughter Serena has had this in her entire lifetime from the time that she was a little girl. And her mother, my wife, also had that when she was a young girl. It's this thing called acid reflux, okay? And they have little prescriptions for it, Prilosec and things like that that people take. It's sort of predictive of what um, what Serena has experienced for herself in her whole life. So I said to her yesterday, I said, honey, I said, do you realize that um, that, that little baby who came out of you shares your DNA and um, shares your blood and uh, is as, you know, just because the cord has been cut, but it's just as connected to you, you know, spiritually uh, and, uh, and, and metaphysically and, and, and uh, mentally, it's just as connected to you as if she were inside of your womb. And that you had this experience yourself. And rather than already setting up this decree that uh, Taylor's going to have this, is just something she's going to have to struggle with. My mother had it. She has, you know, I, I had it, and now, now she's going to have it. I said, you have the capacity to communicate with her and begin to program into her subconscious mind from the time that she, and, and, and every time you look at her and see her, she, she can, when you look at her, she looks at you different than anybody else because you're her mother, you know, and, and, uh, and she looks into your eyes and all that. And instead of telling her that you have acid reflux and I'm really sorry, I'm going to give you more milk than you need so that, and you're going to have this for a lifetime. I said, you have the power to heal this, you know, to put your hand on her stomach and, and, uh, you know, and on her throat. And, and when she's taking this, uh, instead of convincing yourself that this child is going to have this for a lifetime, I want you to begin to just say to yourself, I can heal this for you, honey. And, and talk to her like this. And I put my hand on her stomach and I said, you're such a sweet baby, you know, and, and you don't have to have this throwing up stuff and you don't have anything called acid reflux. You, you're you perfectly healthy. You're a divine creation. You are perfect. Mommy's going to be here for you and show you exactly how to deal with this and start programming her subconscious mind right now so that when words do begin to develop within her and she speaks first in words and then in sentences, what you're going to say is that you don't have this. This is just a, you know, this is just a minor little obstacle and it's not anything that's going to dominate your life. And, you know, and read your sister's book, uh, Goodbye Bumps, because she was able to do the very same thing by shifting her consciousness around. So, you know, we get programmed from the time that we're little, you know, about what we can do and what we can't do, how fast we can run, how much we can lift, how athletic that we are, how good we are at mathematics, how, you know, uh, you know whether or not uh, we're coordinated, whether we can dance, whether we can do a, a headstand, whether we get, we get, it's just almost every, every few minutes of our life, there are these decrees coming out of us. And you don't want to have any decree coming out of you that isn't predictive of what you would like to attract and create for yourself uh, versus a decree that says, it's going to be difficult. I can't make it happen. My luck is never going to work out. I've been sick. We run, This runs in our family. My mother had it. My grandmother had it. And on and on and on and on it goes. Now you will hear about three energy fields and ways of keeping them uncontaminated. 
The first energy field is your immediate energy body, which I also refer to as etheric or faster. From a standing position, extend your arm forward and mentally note the most distant point where your fingers extend. Now imagine your arm extending straight above your head to a point over your body and then behind you and beneath you as well. You now have an image of a field of energy which continuously surrounds your body. I call this field your fast energy body, which is inseparable from your solid and visible slower energy body. Using your imagination, take a moment now to visualize this field of faster energy with its edges or boundaries around you. When another person, particularly a stranger, crosses your boundary, you immediately feel as if you've been invaded. You move back instinctively to create a safer distance. Why? Because your energy body feels the invasive force and alerts you with a state of discomfort. If someone remains in your energy body field for an extended period of time, they begin to affect your entire being with their energy, bringing you down if you feel out of sync with them, and raising you up if they resonate to a higher energy vibration than you. I refer to the second energy field as your broader environmental energy field. To get a sense of this physical energy field, think about your energy field extending into your home, your workplace, your family, and your community. The vibrational pattern of this energy field is your broader environmental energy field. This energy field in which your solid body walks and talks and sleeps and works and plays is impacted by the energy frequency of whoever enters it. Now I want you to think of a field of energy so immense that you cannot even create imaginary boundaries for it. I call this the mind field energy. Your thoughts and the thoughts of others interact in your mind field in such a way as to raise or lower your frequency of vibration. When the thoughts and feelings of others impinge upon your mind energy field, there will be one of two results. Either your energy field will be increased, as is said to have happened when Buddha and Jesus entered a village, just their presence in the village and nothing more would raise the consciousness of those around them. Or, your energy field will be decreased and consequently become contaminated. The way others think and how they radiate out their thought energy can impact you. But it is not only people who impact your energy fields. Noise levels, air quality, food purity, all touch and affect your fields of energy. What you may not realize is that you play a potent role in keeping your energy fields clean and uncontaminated, and that you also have a salubrious and cleansing effect on the energy field of those around you. Hopefully, you will be motivated to begin implementing a new approach that will clear all of your energy fields and maintain a state of clarity, free of energy patterns that contaminate your life in any way. How do you treat this body, which is the living organism that sends out the waves of electromagnetic energy? What foods do you use to replenish and replace it with? What toxins do you absorb? How much peaceful rest do you provide for it? Do you exercise it regularly? Is your emotional state calm? Do you meditate to bring yourself into harmony with God? Your body must be loved. It is your home and must be cleansed of all junk. Your body is not your enemy. You do not need to get free of your body in order to access spiritual guidance. This perfectly functioning machine called your body knows what is needed, where it is needed, and how to prioritize those needs in times of crisis. You control this marvelously complex instrument that is your home through your thoughts. The second factor that impacts your immediate field of energy is what you allow to impact your body from without. What kinds of people do you allow into your immediate space? When you allow toxic people into your immediate energy field, you will find that your feelings of well-being diminish. You must say goodbye, albeit with unconditional love, to anyone who pollutes your life space with slowed down energy. Or, you must be prepared to stave off the intrusion of lower energy people first by recognizing it and then neutralizing it by radiating stronger energy yourself. The problem with attempting to continually be a neutralizer is that the effort required often exhausts you and that level of fatigue makes you susceptible to the lower energies. If someone brings anxiety, shame, depression, fear, whining, complaining, apathy, stress, worry, anger, guilt, or any of the multitude of what I call lower energy patterns, they are inviting you to join in their misery and load your life up with the problems that they live with every day. Resolve to remove yourself from any toxicity that threatens the purity of your life space. 
When you feel yourself being breached, take immediate action. First, by recognizing what is happening, and then moving in counteraction. Consciously send out thoughts of kindness and love. Remove yourself in a conflict-free way from the invading energetic forces. Anyone who you allow to be a regular visitor in your body energy field must come with love, peace, and the higher spiritual energies. The closer you come to being in a dynamic state of grace in your thoughts and refusing to be in the fields of those who are projecting lower energy thoughts, the closer you come to being in God's minefield.